We've been um, working our way through the book of Ephesians, and we're in chapter 5, verses 17 through 21, and it's a passage of the scripture that talks about the filling of the Holy Spirit, and so I'm going to pick up and, and read those verses again, I invite you, if you have your Bible, to, to read along with me, to make notes in your, in your Bible, or on your sermon notes, and um, let's take this and make this a passage that we don't just know, that we're not just familiar with. The one that we choose to live, because that's, that's, that's the only way it really makes a difference in our life. Here's what it says. Ephesians 5, verses 17 through 21. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now last week as we began to explore this, uh, we talked about delighting in the Lord. Because the truth is that Oftentimes, the reason we are not filled with the Holy Spirit is because we do not choose to delight in the Lord. He is not our deepest desire. And if you were here last week, you got some chocolate just to remind you that God is good and to taste and see that He is incredibly good. No chocolate today. Sorry. You missed out. There might be some out there, and there's great snacks out there. But I did give you, for those who were, were here, I gave you a little... Um, insert, and there's some extra copies of this out in the foyer, on practical ways to learn to delight in the Lord, to, to, to appreciate His goodness, to have an admiration for His beauty and His character, to grow in a sense of awe and wonder at who He is, and ultimately to develop an admiration for God as a person that we relate to. And so I hope that tool has helped those of you who, who used it, and for those others, maybe you want to pick it up out before you leave today. It's simply pointing you to some scriptures and some truth that will help us learn to delight in the one who truly is incredibly good. Well, this passage goes on and shows us what being filled with the Holy Spirit looks like in practice. And, and, and this is a very important verse because from here through the end of the letter to the church of Ephesus, it all flows out of this. He said, so that you will know what the will of the Lord is, and the will of the Lord is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And out of that, everything else will be transformed. He begins here with worship, our relationship to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, and what happens in corporate worship. But then he's going to go on in the beginnings of um, uh, the next section to talk about husbands and wives and parents and children and employers and employees. And guess what? They're not separate segments. They're not like he's changed subject. It's all about what happens when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. When his presence is in us, it enables me to love my wife as Christ loved the church. And as she's filled with the Holy Spirit, it enables her to love me as she loves the Lord. She teaches me so much about how to love and honor the Lord. And you see, all of our lives, every relationship that we have is meant to be a living illustration of how we are to relate to God and how He transforms us. So this is incredibly important, important for all the rest of the verses that we'll be looking at. Um, the Holy Spirit is designed his purpose, his function in our life is to permeate us and to transform and power every relationship that we have. Here's what Jesus said about it in John chapter 16. And I love this because this is one of those passages where I read it, but it's still really hard for me to believe it. And I think it, it's, it is maybe for many of us. Here's what Jesus said to the disciples and he says to us. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Now, can you imagine if you were the, one of the disciples and you had spent three years every day with Jesus, how it possibly could get better if he was going to leave? How you're not going to see him day after day and, and listen to what he's saying to you, teaching, listen to 
the things that he would have said to them that maybe aren't recorded were personally convicting and challenging and encouraging. I mean, how hard would that be to believe Jesus' words? And yet he says it is our advantage that he goes away. The reason being is that he's going, he tells us in the, in the next part of the verse, for if I do not go away, the helper, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. In other words, what he's saying is the Holy Spirit is going to, to do a work in you first to bring you to faith in Christ. That's what he does in every single person who becomes a believer. It's because of the working of the Holy Spirit, his conviction within us. But beyond that, he gives us the right worldview about everything around us. It comes not from, from reading the right articles or listening to the right newscasts or having the right political position. It comes from the Holy Spirit showing us who God is and what he is doing in the midst of a darkened and fallen world. And he says, the ruler of this world has already been judged. We are more than conquerors. He wants to give us a foundation to build our life on. What Jesus went on to say, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. It, it's, it's more than what you can take. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truths, where he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, and he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will, um, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, we need to apply that to ourselves. Because this wasn't meant just for the early disciples. It's meant for every believer. The scripture tells us that Jesus lives to make intercession for us right now. He is praying for you and for me before the throne of the Father. And the way that he sends his message back to us of what we need to hear is first of all through his word that he's recorded for us to see about his character and then through the Holy Spirit that will take that word and show us how to apply it and live it in our life. And so we have a counselor with us 24-7. Even better than being able to walk side by side with Jesus in the flesh, his Holy Spirit is with us every moment. And he's the one who can prompt us when we go astray, when, when the words that we say or the thoughts that we have are outside of his character and his will. The Holy Spirit, if we're listening, will turn us back. He'll give us perspective and hope and understanding on the circumstances around us, both in the world and in our own environment, in our family, in the workplace. When we develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit and when he fills us, he will guide us to every circumstance that we have if we will listen. And so Jesus is saying, this is to your advantage. And with this, as we take this passage and then a passage that we'll look at in a few moments in, in John chapter 4, we see that there are two essential things that we need to understand that come through the Holy Spirit, through his working in our heart and our life, that enables us to know how to accomplish the will of God. Because two dramatic things happened in the early church. Because here's the thing. After Jesus died, they were hiding. Peter had denied the Lord. The disciples had abandoned him. And they were in hiding in the upper room. They were trying to, or they were fearful about what was to come. They couldn't understand the death of Jesus. And then the resurrection happens, and, and that transforms everything. But the scripture tells us, that Jesus spent 40 days showing them the scripture and how all the scriptures pointed to Jesus. How the Psalms, how the Old Testament, how the, the teachings of the prophets, how it all applied to the person of Jesus Christ. And so the first thing that transformed them was the truth of scripture. The second thing that transformed them was the presence and filling of the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, it changed them from being fearful 
to being bold, to being able to be a witness for Christ in everything that they did. The truth of Scripture and the transformation of the Holy Spirit are the two things you and I need today as well. Every person who's believed on Jesus as Savior and Lord needs those two elements to be active in them today, to live as evidence, as, as testimony that Jesus is alive, and to accomplish His will and His purpose. We must have both the truth of Scripture and the transformation of the Spirit to live as followers of Jesus Christ and to be evidence to people around us that He is our hope. He is the one who makes a difference. So what is the filling of the Holy Spirit? Well, it is a bit of a mystery. So it's, it's hard for us to understand how a Spirit can live within us, even though that's what the Scripture says. But maybe there's some analogies that we see. There's many different symbols that we see in Scripture, and maybe there's some, some patterns that we can see in our own life that will help us get an understanding of how He works in us. Well, the filling of the Holy Spirit, I believe, first of all, is like a river. It fills its banks, and it is directed by an unseen current. Just as a river flows through the country, just as the Vlatava flows through the, through the heart of Prague and, and throughout the countryside, the Holy Spirit flows into the life of a believer to bring life and refreshment and direction to us. He flows in us. He provides um, an understanding of what He wants us to do. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, He navigates your life just as the bank set the course for a river. Um, and He emphasizes how to seek what God wants for you and what He wants for me. And he takes the stress off of us figuring out his will when we're simply saying, Lord, I give myself to you. I want your, you to direct my life instead of me trying to convince you to bless my plans. Now that imagery of, of a river isn't one I just picked as a good illustration. It comes from the scripture. In John chapter 7, Jesus himself says this, on the last day of the feast, that great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart flows rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Here's the promise. God wants to fill you just like a river. I mean, think about the power of the refreshment that, especially on a hot summer day, I mean, just being able to, to dip your feet into the, the coolness of the river. He wants to be that inside of each and every one of us, but not just a river, but a river of living water, a river of life in you and me. So that's the first example. And that, that example that Jesus is talking about, it, he's quoting scripture as well. He's referring to a passage in Ezekiel Chapter 47, it talks about how out of the very temple of God will flow living rivers of living water. And where is the temple of God today? It's in every believer. He's making the connection. He's saying, here's the fulfillment of the promise. And I believe in heaven there may be a literal fulfillment flowing out of the throne room of God, that river as well. Um, but it also is a fulfillment in the temple of his people. So it's first of all like like a river. Secondly, it's like a sponge. Uh, he saturates every aspect of your being when you allow him to have full control over your life. He permeates your relationships. That's why the next part of the, of the chapter talks about husbands and wives, parents and children, employees and employers. It's, it's the Holy Spirit's work in us. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts or a kind of pattern for how we are to approach marriage or parenting or work. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit in us. But not only will he fill us and fill our relationships, but he is the source, the only source of joy. That's what we read in Romans chapter 14. He says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He wants your life to be filled with joy. And the third illustration is one that does not come from the scripture um, because they wouldn't have been familiar with this illustration. 
but I think it applies very, very well, and that is the Holy Spirit in its filling is like electricity. Okay, so here's how I want to uh, try to explain this. I have here an electrical plug, as you see, and this plug by itself can do absolutely nothing, right? I mean, I have a, a fan here. Some of you I see are fanning yourselves. See, I noticed that, and, and it was hot. Usually, I'm the one who needs the fan. Um, but here, here's the deal. The Holy Spirit is like the electrical current that we need to have our lives plugged into to flow through. If we try to do it in our, on our own, it's just like me trying to power this fan on my own. I can't do it. I'm not going to try. I'm going to plug it in to me, and I'm going to do my best to give you a breeze. Uh, maybe that didn't work. I'm going to give it a little help. I, oh man, it can't even get my pencil in there. I mean, there's no way for me to plug it in and to give a breeze, right? Well, we need to apply that to the Christian life as well. We can't do it unless we're plugged in to the person of the Holy Spirit. Because it's His life that flows through us. And so when we connect ourselves and say, Holy Spirit, would you fill me with your presence? And would you flow your life through me? Then everything changes. Then we have the ability to produce what he wants to do in us and through us. You know, there's, there's a, when we think about electricity and its power, it's something that's unseen. You, you, you can only see its effects. You can't see electricity unless there's a problem, like a short. And, and then you see a spark, and it, it's usually not a good thing. But when it's working, the way it's designed, it's invisible, just like the Holy Spirit who works inside of us, is not something that we can see with our eyes, but you can certainly sense his presence and his effect. Maybe you can even, if I turn it up, maybe you can even sense the breeze. Because the Holy Spirit, when he's in us, he will make your life refreshing to others around you. Isn't that beautiful? You see, from the Holy Spirit flows the freedom to submit to one another out of reverence, out of honor to Jesus Christ. Because we're able to consider others as more important than ourselves because he's in us and his power is flowing through us. From the spirit flows the love of a wife for her husband and a husband's sacrificial love for his wife. From the spirit flows the ability for fathers to wisely instruct their children and for children to obey their parents. From the Holy Spirit flows the ability to do our work for our earthly employers with a sincere heart as we would do it for the Lord. And it gives wisdom to employers to know how to treat and honor with honor and respect for those who work for them. The Holy Spirit brings life through everything that we do. But the truth is, many times we try to operate unplugged. We're not connected. We try to do it in our own strength our own ability. But we're made to have the life of Jesus through his Holy Spirit flow through us. So we're to plug ourselves in. And then what happens? Well, if we go back to our passage, let me read it, read it to you again and um, remind you of what happens when we're plugged in to the person and work of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, before I get back to excuse me, but chapter 5, I want to read something in chapter 3. This was the prayer we looked at before we looked at the Holy Spirit a few weeks ago. It says in Ephesians 3, 14, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses, un, excuse me, surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. When he says be filled with the Spirit, he wants us to be full of his presence. Every part of who you are. That we plug every aspect of our life into Him. You 
You see, that's what overcomes the fear in our life, the guilt, the shame, the loneliness in our life, because we're not operating out of our resource and trying to produce things out of our strength, but it's His presence within us, flowing through us. That's how we can delight in God and allow Him to do His work. So what happens when the Holy Spirit is at work in you? When you're filled, there, uh, there are some things that happen in your life every time as part of it. The first thing is we discover how the Holy Spirit changes us in that he changes our priorities and he enables us to lift up Jesus. When you look through the book, uh, in particular in the book of Acts, there are ten occasions, um, including beginning at Pentecost and then afterwards, which was the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And in each of those times when it talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit, one thing happens, and that is they testify to Jesus. They lift up Jesus. They give witness to who Jesus is. And um, ultimately, the proof that the Holy Spirit is living within us is that we desire to tell others about Jesus. And we look for opportunities to, come, to talk to them, to pray for others, to, and to tell them about Jesus, who he is. All ten of those occasions were accompanied with other things, but the thing that binds them together is that they testify about Jesus Christ. He is the proof. Proclaiming God's mighty works is what happened in the early church as proof of the filling of the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, they were able to speak in different languages, but what they spoke was about Jesus. That's the part we can never miss. And, you know, we have different backgrounds and different understandings of some degrees of what the Holy Spirit does in us and what some of the gifts look like. But the thing that is absolutely in common in every occasion is it prompts people to tell others about Jesus. That's the evidence. Acts chapter 2 says, We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. That's the powerful part. When the Holy Spirit fills you and fills me, you'll be telling other people about Jesus Christ. Also, in fact, in Jesus said this in John chapter 16 about the Holy Spirit. He said, he will glorify me. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the evidence of the Holy Spirit is filling us is that we have a desire to tell others about Jesus because that's what he produces in us and through us. Secondly, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it will always overflow into the lives of others. That's what our passage in Ephesians 5 is all about. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Now I want you to notice what it says there. We're going to break it down in just a moment. The melody goes to the Lord. He's the audience. But did you see what it said first? It says addressing one another, to speaking to one another. There's a part of both being filled with the Holy Spirit and of corporate worship that is designed to build up the body of Christ. Part of the reason why we come together and we worship together musically is because it engages all of us through the work of the Holy Spirit to build up our faith to help us understand who we are in Christ. And the truth is, I know this, it's humbling, but chances are you'll remember a song far better than you'll remember any sermon or even a small snippet of a sermon I preach. Because we take those songs with us, and they're powerful, and they can, they can be used when they're filled with truth and filled with the Holy Spirit to build up the faith of one another. Now, from that, from that overflow, it affects what we say. It says addressing one another. And I told you guys a couple of weeks ago that when you become a Christian, when you follow Jesus Christ and you put your trust in him as Savior and Lord, we all become bilingual. We have the language of our birth and we have the language of heaven. The filling of the Holy Spirit speaks to our lives with a voice that is different than the selfish voice of, of my old life. 
And, and Paul, in chapter 5, contrasts those, voices, uh, those languages. He says in verse 3, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So he's saying, don't do this, but here's what we're to do when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Out of us, we will address one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so there are four evidences that are verbal part um, of the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The first one is encouragement. Paul, I believe, had this in mind when he says that, addressing one another. When we come together, we should be building up one another in the Lord. And that's a part of the corporate act of worship. The audience should be Jesus, the Lord. But we do sing to one another. There's a, there's a beautiful tradition that happened in, in Israel, in the temple, when they would worship. We don't know a lot about what worship in the temple in the Old Testament looked like because there's, there's not a lot of descriptions that are written down in, in Scripture. But one of the things that was common is they would take the Psalms and they would have um, they would have cantor or they would have choir. You, when you read through the titles of the Psalms, oftentimes you know it talks about the, the type of tune that it goes to, or who was singing it, or who wrote it, and it's giving us some insight about how they did worship. One of the things that was common in Israel was a thing called antiphonal singing. Now that's a, that's a word that if English isn't your first language, and even if it is, chances are you don't have a clue what it means. Here's what it means. It means the leader would sing something, and then the congregation would sing something back. Or the choir would sing something, or the praise team would sing something, and then there would be a response that came back. And, and so you would, you would say a truth, and then the congregation would sing something about that back out of the songs. It would be like, in some of our, um, some of our traditions, it would be kind of like responsive reading, but it was done in music. That's a beautiful thing that I, I hope we, we recapture in some ways in our worship because it builds up one another. The Holy Spirit speaks to one another in corporate worship. That's why sometimes in, you know, we, we need to understand this is why the enemy seeks to cause division over worship in churches. It's because it is evidence of the Holy Spirit and it is a resource that builds up his church to be obedient and faithful to the Lord. And sometimes what will, people will say is if they come from a, a more uh, traditional, perhaps, background, they'll say, well, we have too many songs that talk about me. And, and that can be true. We can get out of balance. and it is, We're not singing about us. We're singing about him. But we're also addressing one another. And so there are songs that we do need to sing, and truths that we do need to declare from the scriptures that will build up one another. That's why we did you say, and we're going to do it again, is we need to hear those truths about what God says about us and allow that to sink deep into us so that we can live the life he's called us to live. We need to believe who he says we are. And so that's, a, that's a, an element of worship as well. Now, secondly, he goes on and, and not only talks about addressing one another in encouragement, but secondly, worship and praise. When Paul says singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, he, he's speaking of writing music. But since this is to the Lord, it is very clearly the music that Christians use to proclaim the greatness and goodness of our God. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, that should be our desire to worship him, to lift him up. Musical worship is powerful because it is the language of the soul. In music, both our minds and our spirits are engaged in having our hearts focused on the Lord. And that's why I encourage you, one of the ways to grow closer in the Lord is to listen to music, to sing along. You don't have to be musical to do it, but allow that truth to both touch your mind and your spirit so that you may worship and praise the Lord for who he is. The third one that he mentions here is thanksgiving. Paul has already mentioned thanksgiving once in this section, 
And he contrasted it with six sins of immorality, impurity, greed, obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse um, joking. Now he returns to this theme again, and, and he's saying that the proper outworking of the Holy Spirit in the life of one who believes in Jesus is thanksgiving. That should define more than anything what we say. We should be people of thanks. But there's one more. And it's the last part of the section. He says, not only do we encourage and address one another, not only do we worship and praise, not only do we give thanksgiving, but the other evidence that we're filled with the Holy Spirit is submitting to one another out of reverence or honor to Christ. Because we love Jesus and are filled with the Holy Spirit, it means that life is not about us. We're set free from the prison of pride. It's about honoring Jesus and giving preference to one another out of love for Jesus. And it is the most liberating truth you can encounter. Because when you truly understand life isn't about me, it's all about Him, but God loves us so very much that He sings over us, we're set free to say, God, I want what you want. I want you. And as we're collectively filled with the Holy Spirit, True worship begins to happen and we're brought together in unity as one because of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus, when he's talking with the woman at the well, a woman from Samaria, he says this in John 4, 23, but the hour is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. In um, church history, church tradition, we had a movement just a few years ago called the, the Seeker Movement. And, um, and God did some beautiful and great things through that. And there's people who disagree with the tactics. That doesn't matter. What I want you to see is God is the seeker. God is seeking you to worship Him. He is seeking you today, right now. He loves you so very much. He has a plan and a purpose for your life, and he wants you to be filled with the fullness of God. That's how much he loves you. And Jesus says, he's seeking you right now. The Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit-filled worship is not defined by style, by preference, or by a gifted leader, although those can be helpful. True spirit-filled worship is dependent upon obedience to the Lord, submission to His truth, and the control and presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes it work, what makes it beautiful, and fills it with life. Worship that produces joy and transformation happens when we look to the Holy Spirit to be our worship leader. And each individual asks Him to make them His instrument. And to tune our hearts, our minds to the truth of who Jesus is and the joy of being in His presence. That's when true worship What do we do with that? Well, in your notes, I have, I have some thoughts from the scripture on how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because I hope that's your desire. And so I'm just going to walk through those, and, and I want you to take them sometime during this week and reflect on them. Reflect on where you are. Ask the Lord to show you where you are. To be filled with the Holy Spirit, first of all, we must confess and turn from our sin. We must recognize the Holy Spirit brings conviction on our life and shows us areas where we're out of alignment with Him. Secondly, we need to recognize our need to be filled, which means repenting of pride, of trying to do things on our own strength, trying to live life unplugged to the Holy Spirit. And so what we need to do in order to turn from that is surrender control of our life, of every area of our life, to the Holy Spirit. And say, Lord, you take me. You take control because I want what you want. And then 
we have to take a step of belief. We ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, in speaking of the Father, he gave a contrast in a parable in the book of Luke, where he urged people, and he gave us this promise, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He invites us to ask to be filled. But we're not just to ask for ourselves, we're also to pray for others to be filled. Because this isn't, this isn't an individualistic thing, it's a, it's a corporate thing for the church as a whole. And not just ICP, but all the churches in Prague, all of God's churches from all of our different home countries. We want to pray consistently that the Holy Spirit will fill them, that they will know Him, and that they'll testify of the greatness of Jesus. That's the, the next thing. We need to be willing to be a witness, to proclaim the mighty works of God. If I'm unwilling to tell others about Jesus, I'm not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit because I'm in rebellion against Him. And we need to desire to truly worship in a way that honors God and builds up others. And then finally, we need to expect the Holy Spirit to fill His church and to proclaim that Jesus is alive. The final part is that I've placed in your sermon notes there in the bulletin a sample prayer to give you some guidelines to help you pray to ask for this. I'm going to read through it, but I want to urge you to pray it on your own because this is, this is something that you, it has to flow from your heart and my heart. It's not something that we do under compulsion. It is a willingness of saying, Lord, would you fill us with your presence? But here's, here's some thoughts on it. Our Father in heaven, you are holy. May your greatness be seen on earth and in my life as it is in heaven. Through the salvation Jesus Christ purchased on the cross, I come to you. I confess my sin, my selfishness, and pride. And then, then confess those specifics to the Lord. Today I'm turning from myself and returning to you. Because you are my only source. I want you. And a closeness with you more than anything else. I love you more. I desire to be accurate evidence that Jesus is alive and that he is God. Therefore, I bow my life to you. Father, that according to your riches in glory, I might be strengthened and filled with the Holy Spirit. I submit to his control. I ask that he align my life to your purpose. I ask that the Spirit would teach me, comfort me, guide me, and transform me that I may reflect Jesus' character, rest in his authority, and love others with his passion. By faith, I receive your grace and your presence. Fill not only me, Personally, but fill Jesus' church that we call ICP with the Holy Spirit. Empower us to live in unity with all the saints and to accomplish what you as the author of our lives have written for us. Make us one with you and with each other that we may show the world Jesus and proclaim the mighty works of God. Lord, would you make that the desire of our heart? Speak to each and every person here. Lord, for those who do not yet know you, Lord, would you simply give them the courage to say, Jesus, save me. I need you. I don't understand all these things. I don't understand all the stuff this guy's talking about, but I know there's something missing in my life, and I think it's you. Jesus, save me. Lord, would you just give them the courage to cry out your name, because the promise of your word is whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Lord, would you give them the faith to do that right now today? For others that already know you, Lord, would you give us the faith to believe what your word says, that you want to fill us with your fullness? And, and Lord, give us the courage to take a step of faith and say, Lord, it's all yours. I lay out my life to you. Because you are worthy. You're the one I want. And Lord, would you fill us? 
Would you make this the desire of our heart as a people? And then have your way with us. Lord, lead us to accomplish anything you want us to do. And Lord, to, to pray that, I have to be willing to pray, do in us whatever you want to do, even if that means hardship and difficulty and suffering, because what you have is best, even if I can't see it. Give us eyes to see that you are good so that we can trust you with what we cannot see. Oh Lord, we just come before you today and ask that you would have your way. Thank you, Lord. In the great and mighty name of Jesus.